Welcome to Safety Professional Mentoring number four, root cause analysis. So how do you perform a root cause analysis using the 5 Y method? Let's figure it out. Uh, the 5Y method comes from Toyota Motor Corporation. Uh, they had a goal of reducing problems and variations in their products. This came out of the uh, total quality management movement, uh, Deming and Uran. Um, it has its use. Uh, it's as very simple, it's very easy to use, it's very easy to conceive, but does have its limitations. For quality, safety, and environmental incidents, particularly safety, the main problem is confirmation bias. In other words, I go in there and I think I know exactly what went on, and therefore I guide the process and I get exactly the result. So we have to be able to come up with a way to get around that. Some of that is just gonna be being very disciplined. So how do you do this? Well. Previous, uh, previous session, I talked about how to do an interview and use the interview asking questions using the fishbone diagram. And you take a look at the various lines of questionings and you're basically trying to come up with where is the information, where does the, uh, where does it, uh, where can the fault lie? Where can the root cause actually exist within that? And you'll fill those up pretty quickly and you'll get a good indication of where that can be. And so you basically have to start out by asking the question, why? Now, this is something you don't do as part of the interview process because a why is an accusatory question. But what I typically will do is after I get all the information in is I will involve the people that were part of the incident and start asking that question, why? And I always predicate this with the, with the, with the following statement. My goal is to find out where my system failed. Okay, there may be personal things that we did or didn't do as part of this entire event, but I'm just trying to figure out where the system can be improved. So the main discipline you got to have with the five whys is ask the, ask the starting question, you know, why did this incident occur? And then you turn each because statement into the next why statement without much rewording. And so you're trying to follow the same logic all the way through. Now, five whys, does it actually mean you stop at five? No, it can mean you go as deep as, you know, 20. Uh, does it mean that you only do it once? No, I've had, I will ask the why question starting out um, several times. I've done as many as a dozen to be able to get down to it. The basic thing that you're trying to do is you're trying to find what is the root cause. Okay, so great. What's a root cause? You know you have a root cause when you can toggle that root cause, you know, get present or not present, on or off. And you can basically create the incident again or prevent the incident from happening. Now, sometimes it's going to be really hard to test. Okay, sometimes you can. Um, sometimes you just sort of have to put something in place and let it roll. And it sort of depends upon what kind of root cause you have. So when you go through the five whys, you'll end up with one, maybe two, maybe two, usually one thing that you can actually say, hey, yes, this is probably or definitely the real root cause of the situation. The other ones that you come up with as part of the five whys are typically going to be your contributing factors, the stuff that was around the root cause, but not necessarily as part of the causal link but they're correlated. So cause and correlation are two different concepts. The Department of Energy uh, has their manual on investigations. It's actually quite good. If you have a chance, uh, go on to the Department of Energy website and download it. It's pretty extensive. It's over a couple hundred pages. Um, and basically, they're, they use a process safety um, methodology, process safety management, and they're looking to how you can design a system that doesn't fail. Um, so we basically, they take a look at the Swiss cheese model of, of uh, cause and effect. And if you take a look at that in Wikipedia, there's actually a pretty decent explanation of how that works. Uh, this has been used for even COVID-19. And so there's a good amount of, of understanding of what that looks like. And you can have either active or latent factors that is part of that entire Swiss cheese model. Essentially what it happens is there's holes in every defense. And if you have enough of the defenses with a hole in it and it all lines up, you go all the way through to all the way to the end and the instant uh, instant's gonna happen. 
And all you need is that one defense there and could have stopped the entire progression. And so what we're looking at is the entire event progression that we talked about in the previous video, which is you go all the way down as to how that event took place and put everything in order. And then you look for what is the critical path. And that critical path, according to the Swiss cheese model, should have had some defenses. And if it didn't happen, well, that's what you got. Department of Transportation, specifically the United States Coast Guard, um, they basically look at it from a mismatch perspective, that there was a mismatch between the situation and what was involved in that. So the classic example of this, the vessel foundered and then went down because it was part of seas that were, it was too rough for it to handle, hurricane, storm, something like that or it was just too old, that type of thing. There's a mismatch in between what was present at the time and the situation that had to take place. Now, with most injuries, there is a human component as well. And so you got to think about this from the perspective of how human beings typically operate and how this, what this looks like. So I tend to think of it as three big buckets. So one big bucket is a willingness component. The other one is a resources component, and the other one is an external factors component. So what do these look like? Willingness is basically it's an attitude. I refuse to do this. I won't do it. That type of thing. So, you know, are you willing to actually do the job? Well, no. Okay. You got a, you got a discipline issue there. You, you can have a resources as a factor. So that's your limitation. Okay. This person was not trained. They don't really know what they're doing. They didn't have the proper tools at the time. Um, the planning of the job was inadequate. They didn't have enough time to get it done and all those other types of things that go in there. External factors is basically it's an external overwhelming of the system that couldn't be anticipated. Um, one thing I have actually seen on my own two eyes, a deer crashing through the rear driver's side window of a SUV going down the road. No way the driver could actually see the deer react to it or anything else like that. Didn't hit it. The deer actually ran into the vehicle and crashed into the window. Uh, another one that I physically saw is, you know, the first car stops at the, at the red light. Second car stops at the red light. Big delivery truck comes behind it and does not stop and smashes into the second car and the first car. First car driver, absolutely nothing they could have done about it, can't anticipate it. You basically just have to hope that your safety systems uh, limit the limit the damage as much as possible and protect you. And that's, that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, this gets into that mismatch and also into the Department of Energy thing. There's got to be some defenses there. Okay, so in safety, a lot of times that's PPE, sometimes it's administrative, sometimes that's planning, whatever that is. The other thing is if you end up with a resources issue when you're doing your root cause analysis, go up one level in the chain of command. So you got the worker, go up to the foreman, then go up to the superintendent, then go up to you know the, the senior management and take that all the way down. And basically what you're trying to do there is there may be a willingness issue on top of that. So I had it before where I um, had people that were in a trench um, had to pull them out, the trench collapsed, and it was just you know, just a bad deal all the way around. Nobody injured, thankfully. And so we started going through that as a near miss investigation and eventually ended up with, well, the planning of the job did not anticipate going to a regulated depth. So therefore, they didn't put anything in there for a trench box. And the area that they were going through was too constrained for, for uh, laying it back on a one-to-one. On -one. And so therefore, they just you know, winged it and just hoping they can get through it and, and quickly as possible that nobody would notice and nobody would get hurt. Okay, so that was a willingness issue. And they basically that was a mismatch of what the plan was with the actual conditions and then being unwilling to stop the work and actually get the trench box because, hey, we just don't have the money for that within, within the budget. So keep that in mind. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of talk through how you end up with a uh, with a good root cause analysis. So here's here's your setup. Okay, so I'm thinking that uh, I'm at a uh, PV solar plant and we are in the process of building it. And a worker gets injured because he gets his hand pinched between one tube and another tube when they're coming together. 
essentially what you have is just like an exhaust pipe. You have one that's necked down a little bit, one that's a little bit, uh, one that's a little bit, little bit bigger. You have a series of holes in it. One gets inserted into the other. You get a pin that goes all the way through it and gets bolted up. And that provides the torque to be able to mount your panels onto it. And then the panels are then attached to it. That torque tube is attached to a tracker in the panels and attracts the sun back and forth. So that's the setup that, that you have there. And this is actually sometimes a pretty common injury that does happen. Whenever you have a lot of sheet metal that's moving around, uh, the chances of something happening like this, you know, are are pretty high. And, you know, it's it's going to happen. Hopefully you got decent PPE on so you minimize it. But even then, sometimes you are going to end up with a laceration. Sometimes you are going to end up with a fracture. Of course, we try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, once you do get the two tubes together, there's a tapered pry bar. Think of it as a spud bar if you're familiar with, um, uh, with steel erection. Uh, they use that to align the holes, and then they put the pin through that type of thing. If they jam the two tubes to, together too hard so they can't align it, then there's a lot that has to happen to, to get that done. So you do have to pay attention. And uh, the other thing that happens is they typically rotate the people that are on this because the people that are setting the tubes um, that's an athletic event. You need to be an industrial athlete or construction athlete to be able to do that. And it's very tiring. So they'll rotate people through. So it's not a stable type of thing where you have the same two people or four people that are working all the time. So uh, part of the setup, okay, the injury happened, it got reported. You have gone out to the site. You've taken the photographs. Uh, the people go back. You know, they write out their witness statements. You've already done the, you've already done the, uh, uh, the interviews, and basically you've asked the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how. And now, five whys. Okay, so let's use the five why method to sort of take a look at this setup and this incident and see what this looks like. Okay, so what we have here is a... Um, form that I've used. Basically, it's just an Excel spreadsheet. And you don't need to get real fancy with the five whys. Um, there's obviously some stuff you can get out there. I just like using Excel. It works pretty well for me. So you start out with the start out with the, with the first why. Why was there a hand injury? And the answer is pretty darn physical uh, because the hand was pinched between two torque tubes during installation. Well, why was the hand pinched? because the worker placed his hand over the end of the tube during movement. Number three, why did he place his hand over the end of the tube during movement? And this is coming right from the worker because you did the investigation. He's on the phone when you're going through this, or you got him in the room because the worker was attempted to line the tube for pinning. So why was the worker trying to align the tube for pinning? And his reply is because he was trying to make the subsequent task easier. Because if you can get the holes lined up exactly right, it makes the next guy that does the throws the pin in there very easy. And so when you grab the when you grab that tube and you grab by the end, you got more torque on it because you know those tubes are about six, eight inches in diameter. You can't really get a grip on it unless you get a really big hand. So why was he trying to make it easier? Well, because the worker just rotated uh, from that task to to be, in, to be in there. And he was just trying to help out the next guy. He was trying to be a nice guy and, and be be really be really efficient. So this is the kind of person that, if you think about it, was he willing to do the right thing? Is he trying to do the right thing? And the answer to that is why. So you basically have a, have a good actor here. Okay, so then the next thing that comes up. So why was the tube not aligned when the worker first handled the tube? And so now we're looking into the methods of machinery type of thing because the tubes are rolled into the handling position on a rack result, result, resulting in random alignment. In other words, you have the tube and then you have basically 180 degrees the holes. And so when that rolls into position, they grab it, they go to put it into place. It's basically, it's a random type of thing because the distance that it has to roll for the first one is different from the, from the you know, number 15 that's in there. So why are the two, why are the tubes rolled? Well, because the round shape is part of the engineer design. Fair enough. The engineer knows to be round. Well, why did they design them round? Well, the answer is because 
a round tube uses the least amount of materials. It's also a very strong shape, resulting in the lowest, lowest cost and the energy use from a life cycle analysis perspective. In other words, here we are, renewable energy industry. We're trying to minimize the amount of energy it takes to put a plant together. And because of that, you try to use the most efficient shape and you then use something that's round. Now, can you use can you use something that is square? Well, sure, but keep in mind, now you have four sharp edges because you got the 90 degree corners. So again, that's a sort of a design element. Now, could you actually make that change halfway through a project? And the answer to that is no, the safety person is not gonna have ability to do that. That was designed way back when, and you basically gotta, gotta roll with it, pardon the pun. So then you can, the next thing you say, well, okay, again, machinery methods, why is this two-step two uh, two process used? Well, because the torque tubes sections are designed for containerized transportation. So you put them in a container, you pull them out of a container. Well, why are the torque tube sections sized for containerized? In other words, why couldn't they put them in exactly as they needed to be in the field? Well, because when you put them in a container, they're protected from the elements and damage during shipment. Okay, that's a pretty decent choice to be able to make. And so this is sort of a design type of thing, designed in engineering. Uh, did it have a potential consequence? Well, the answer is yes, because now I got a field assembly. Well, can you actually use a robot to do this? Or you could do, do, could do a different way where it doesn't get assembled in the same way? Uh, potentially, is it gonna happen on this job? Uh, probably not. So let's go at this again. So why was the tube moved horizontally while the hand was in the pinch point? In other words, this entire thing had to be sent over. You have one person on one side, one person on the other side, guys trying to get it into, into the other tube and the other guy's gonna push it in. Fair enough. Well, the reason why is because the workers had developed a rhythm. Obviously, if you're working on something after a while, you sort of develop a rhythm to what you're doing. Okay, and these guys basically had developed a rhythm for what they were doing. So why do these workers develop, develop it? Well, it's real repetitive. And what happens with any human brain is that you got something repetitive and you're gonna go from something that requires a lot of concentration on the frontal lobe and it's gonna you know, be pushed back in the brain, pushed back in the brain until it becomes automatic and then you can do other stuff. Think about tying your shoes. When you were a kid, the first time you tied your shoes, it was entire, you know, overwhelming experience trying to, you know, think that through. Now you're at the point where you can tie your shoe and you're talking to somebody else and you're answering a phone and every, you don't even think about it because your brain had automated it. Same thing's going to happen when you ever you have something that is repetitive, you're going to end up with a rhythm. So why did the workers develop their own rhythm? Well, because the working peers had done this over time with great success. In other words, this is sort of just the way it's done. We call that tribal knowledge. Okay. So it just happens that that's the way it develops and it's been really successful over time. So root cause here, um, potential, a positive communication for the movement was not established. Now coming from the military, um, my perspective is that uh, when you're going to do something that requires coordination, you're going to, you're going to communicate it. Okay. So, if we're going to uh, if we're going to assault a room, we're going to do a stack by the door. We're going to do a, a grab, grab, grab all the way back. So everybody is making certain that everything's up. And then the back guy is going to do initiate the same thing goes to the front. When it goes to the front, then the guy basically makes a hand and arm signal. Boom, we go through the door. Everybody goes exactly where they're supposed to go within the room. OK, so there's that verification. And uh, we also call this three part communication. Uh, basically, you say, um, Hey, do this. The other guy says, okay, uh, I understand this is what we're going to do. And then you confirm it back that the, that the message has been received. So that didn't happen. Now, does it have to happen all the time? Uh, sort of subject of, subject of a little bit of um, discussion on that. You know, can you have something that just happens without having communication? The answer to that is yes. But is it the best practice? Probably not. Okay, so could we actually make a corrective action here? Well, yeah, you could have basically everybody set up to do the same thing. You train people to say, okay, um, moving, and then the other, the other guy has to say clear, 
and then he says moving again and basically slides the thing home. So if you do something like that, you have the ability to be able to have something that, that goes in here. And obviously on this form, I have a couple more five Ys. So in this case, what I basically did is come through three. So then we go back into it and sort of ask the question. If these guys would have communicated and had a means and methods of saying stop, and the person actually did stop and it followed the command, would this have prevented the incident? And the answer to that is yes, presuming everything goes well. Now, is that 100%? Well, no, because you still can have a miscommunication issue or I heard it wrong, that type of thing. But if you have something that goes along this line, you can then test it out. Okay, so let's get everybody together and say, hey, what we're going to do when we go to move these tubes, you're going to say moving, the other guy is going to say clear or stop. Two very, very different words. And if it's clear, he's going to put, he's going to drive the thing in, into it. And if it's a stop, he's going to release. Okay, he's not going to put any forward pressure onto that tube. And so if you do that, would that have solved the incident? Probably. Would it solve the recurring incident that's in the field? And the answer to that is we're going to find out because we're going to test that out. Okay, so essentially what we're going to try to do is to put a uh, put a piece of Swiss cheese there that is going to have that block. So, hey, we have a barrier there. That barrier is the communication. I intend on moving this. It's either a I'm clear, ready to go or stop, don't go. Okay, so you put a barrier there. And then the other thing from the Coast Guard perspective is you have a mismatch. And the mismatch was not having the communication and not having not having stuff set up to be able to do that, to have that kind of a check. So if you do both of those things, the chances are you're going to have something that is going to resolve this issue. So five whys. Does work. Is it going to be the absolute best thing? Probably not. But is it a good tool? The answer is yes. So with the five whys, what, how is the best way to be able to get this done? Okay, so it takes some repetitions. And the, the hardest thing is that when you think that you know what's going on and you try to get it through, we talked about the confirmation bias. The other thing is to be able to split things up. So you want to only go down one part of the Ishikawa diagram at a time, and you may actually go have may have to go may actually have to go into each one of those separately. So what I suggest you do is go through a few of the old incidents that you have, and then go through the evidence, and then start asking the start asking the five why question, and develop that along several different lines, and then. Once you get to all the potential root causes, then ask yourself the question, which one of these root causes, maybe two at the most, would actually toggle this thing on and off? And once you do have that, then that's probably going to be your root cause. Now, one of the problems that you have with the five whys is you may not have all the information necessary. Okay, so in my example, I could not get into the design elements. Okay, so do I have the ability to affect that as a safety professional? Probably not. That's going to be design. Now, can I feed that back into the, into the engineering design as part of the company? Probably so. And so that's one of those times you come up with your lessons learned and say, hey, folks, we've had a lot of problems here of people getting injured on these round tubes. Is there any way possible we could explore using a square tube? Maybe so. There, I know there are some torque tubes that are square. Okay, and then the, then the entire question begs, are those actually safer? So then that would be another whole another line of inquiry to get into safety and design. And if you do that properly, and then you can basically come up with what is the best way to, be, to go about this. Now, one thing to keep in mind, you never get a benefit without a cost. There always is a trade-off. There's no thing that is perfectly safe. There's probably no best safe. Okay, so there's always going to be a trade off there. You're always going to have something that is going to be off that is going to go wrong. 
So we are going to be doing the absolute best we can with what we got. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a great safe day.